what does it really mean? What does it entail? What does it need? And tonight, um, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, and I said uh, from verses 1 to 24. So, if you don't mind, let's all rise to read God's word. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, or Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with, dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is, who says to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, where, um, where then do you get that living water? As you, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water sh sh what, uh, that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is, is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. May the Lord bless us as we have read the word. Let's all be seated. One of the things that happen when, when we come to church, we're asked, uh, hi, how are you? And what do we normally say in response? We go, hi, I'm fine. Do you want me to translate that? It's really, get out of my face. I don't want to tell you what's really happening to me. <laughs> or, I don't think you're that interested. Or, it's more like, um, I have nothing, uh, nothing interesting to offer you. And many times, there are many, like I said, there are many reasons for people to not desire to come to church. And might I suggest to you that it's possible that it is because they are not worshiping in spirit and in truth. What does it really mean to be able to come to church and meet with God? Um, so let me ask you this question. It's just, it's just uh, hypothetical. Uh, did you come to church tonight in faith? Or are you expecting to commune with the Lord today? probing questions, aren't they? What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? What are the reasons that we come to church? Well, if I were honest, I would say sometimes I come to church because I like the people here or because the bread is free. <laughs> but really, none of this will actually be enough. It's more often than not, like, do we really meet with God when we come here? 
is it is he there to touch us is he is he real so in our in our settings today we're going to uh, be looking at john chapter 4 like i said in verses 1 to 24. from verses 1 to 4 it's about like when jesus had been declared by john to be the lamb of god and his group or his disciples had gotten many and they started to baptize people right and basically he was growing in popularity and finally the the, the pharisees heard about this so realizing the implications of all of that and they were going to start uh, giving him problems he decided to leave judea and go for galilee and in verse 4 it says here but he needed to go through samaria normally a jew would uh, go all the way around go all the way around uh, samaria just to avoid that place because it's full of samaritans now what are samaritans you ask well, Samaritans is, uh, the, uh, Samaria was actually a place where it was actually um, attacked by Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And, um, and because of that, like, you know, when, when, a, when a people attacks, it's like because of, it was also because of the sin of, of uh, Israel when, when they were attacked, but God allowed it, right? But what happens usually is when invaders come, they settle there. And then they're, after they're, they've been there for a while, they start to settle in and start marrying the, peop the locals. Um, if you're not so familiar, let me use the illustration of the Americans in the Philippines and in Vietnam. What normally happens is that when there's a base, you suddenly, somehow, finally there comes a point where you see uh, Filipinos and Vietnamese who actually have blue eyes and blonde hair, if you know what I mean. And, men, and these people, like it or not, they, they have the stigma of being, of being born out of wedlock. But that was not the only reason for the people in Samaria because it was pretty much like, oh, they were overcome by, Nebuchad, by Nebuchadnezzar. It's like because of their sin that, that, uh, that uh, the Jews were looking down upon them. So it's very much like, I'm better than you. You, are, you, are, uh, uh, you were born out of wedlock. And basically, what this is, is, is hypocrisy. But then when Jesus says, uh, when, when John says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, I would suggest that it was not really because he was just trying to get out, away from the Pharisees, but it was really because of this woman. It was because he wanted, he, uh, they had, he had an appointment with this woman. Um, in verse 5, he says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sikar, Near the, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now, Sikar was like really near Shechem, where it's like it's mentioned many times, at least 60 times in the Old Testament, where so much history has happened. It's really important that we like maybe uh, later go through the different times when in, in, through the Bible it is mentioned, and you can see how important it is to, to biblical history. But of all of the things that were there, it was, it was noted that uh, Jacob's well was there in verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Basically, not only did he go straight through, he really needed to, to, get, to, he really needed to go, uh, get to Galilee through Samaria. But instead of just uh, pushing, uh, going around, he had to go there through, through, Samaria, uh, through Samaria to be able to sit with this woman. So, what does it really mean to, to do it in spirit? In verse 7, it says, when a, Samaritan when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Will you give me a drink? He see here Jesus starting to evangelize, and he was using something that was there already. He said, Oh, can you give me a drink? He's talking about the well. Um, basically, he was trying to engage the woman in, into a conversation. In verse 8, it's, he says, it says, His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Might I say just also that they had gone into town to buy food, but maybe really the purpose of the Lord was for them to not be there when he talks to this woman about her life. We will see why. In verse 9, he says, The woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. Here she was trying to understand how it is that while everybody else looked down upon her, well, every other Jew, rather, was looking down upon her, and she really had no voice with them. Here was this Jew who was asking her for a favor. Far be it from, for, for a Jew to actually to touch anything that the, that the Gentiles have touched, much less drink it. Right? So, so he was, she was really astounded by what he was asking her. 
He says, you're a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Not only was she a Samaritan, which means they were already a social, lower social caste, but she was also a, a woman, even lower in, in, in the eyes of, of uh, social strat, in the social strata of the times. So she goes, how can you ask me for, for a drink? He actually, she actually even says, or maybe even John points out, for the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. It was so much so that whenever, whenever a, a Jew and a Samaritan met, it was already expected that the Jew would not have anything to do with the Samaritans, or the Samaritans would expect the Jew to, to not deal with them. Kind of like when, it's, when we're here in the United States and we, are different, we have different races. It's, I'm just happy that when people come to our church, they see a, you know, a whole variety of colors and they see us loving each other. But you can see that all of this, the Lord will say, is all, is all uh, hypocrisy and prejudice. So verse 10 says, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, or if you knew what God had for you, is it possible that some, many times we come to church, we meet with Jesus, we supposedly meet with Jesus when we come to church, right? But we have no idea what is waiting for us in church. Have you ever thought of that? That maybe this time in church, there's a gift that's waiting for me. But we are oblivious. We're just expecting uh, when they say, how are you? Oh, same old, same old. When we give that answer, what is that telling us? That there is no expectation of any relationship with the Lord. It's just going to be the same old, same old, and nothing's going to happen. Right? So let's, let's think about that. Um, but if you knew the gift of God and who, and who it is that asks you for a drink, if you had any understanding of who I am, then it would be far from you to not ask me for anything. Sometimes we come to church and just say, oh yeah, the Lord is there, you know, and I'm here. And the possibility is he doesn't really hear me. Is there anyone here who the Lord just spoke to today or yesterday? You know, our experience hardly is ever like, oh, I, I talked to him yesterday and he told me this, you know? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if you could, we could sit down after the service and just say, what was the last thing the Lord told you? When was this? Yesterday? No, 10 years ago. But do you remember when he last spoke to you? When there's actually, it's like, you come, we come to church and we have no idea who it is, who it is that, that really seeks to commune with us, that really seeks to, have, to, to engage us in, to, in a conversation. He says, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the verse suggests to us that it is because we do not know who Jesus is. Right? Mind you, he was talking to a non-believer at this time. But maybe sometimes even as believers, we have no idea, we have no inkling who Jesus is. And therefore we just say, how was your service? So-so. Did you meet with the Lord? Yeah. <laughs> if you really met with the Lord, was that, is that, you think, the, the proper response? Yeah. You must have met somebody, but I don't think it was the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Did anything happen in church? Same old, same old. Right? And this is what is, uh, what is available to us. It's living water. Um, he says, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked. It's a gift. It's, the word is dor Dorian, or which means it's a gift. It's something that is not worked for. Which means when we come to worship, we don't need to work our worship, we, need, we don't necessarily need to labor over lifting up worship that is acceptable to Him. The difference is, we are, ask, are we really asking God to help us to worship Him? We all know and understand that we can, we can never give anything to God that will really wow Him, right? You think we can wow Him with our singing? Or maybe even our ability to play the guitar? Or what is it that can wow God? Isn't, is it really our hearts that, that he can see our love for him? Okay, so, and then he says, uh, we would have understood that what he is giving us is living water. What does it really mean to have living water? We don't understand it. He it says, it's basically the woman was saying, well, 
um, I have no idea what, what's going on. And, and the, Jesus was saying, well, if you only knew what I have for you, and if you only knew who I am, then maybe there would be something happening here. And isn't it true that when we come to church and we have no idea who Jesus is and we have no idea what, he, what can happen in the service, we're going to go home just the same. Just the same. Nothing changed. Verse 11. Sir, the woman said, if you have nothing to draw with, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. So she was dealing with this with what she can see. First, she can see that Jesus didn't have any buckets. Right? And she, knows, and she knew that the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? Now she was interested, but it's, she still couldn't understand or she couldn't fathom what it really means for Jesus to be able to provide living water. Now here's, a, here's something I think I believe that the Lord uh, just showed us. In Genesis 29 verses 1 to 3, I would like to read this to you. Those of you who have Bibles can also turn. Genesis uh, three, uh, 29 verses 1 to 3 says, So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. So basically he did not really just dig arid ground. He, was already, he already came to a well, right? He saw a well in the field and behold there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. What does that show you? The, that the sheep were already there enjoying the the, the water, okay? Um, for out of the well, they watered the flocks. The people, the shepherds rather, were watering the flocks out of the well. And here's the thing. A large stone was on the well's mouth. A large stone was on the well's mouth. So basically, there was a well. It's not sure whether, the, like when you see a well, usually there's a cement around it, like a, like a um, what do you call it? The concrete, right? All around it so people don't fall in. But basically, it was just a hole in the ground. And what they had to do was they had to put a big stone over it. Um, it says, a large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would draw the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. Do we understand what's happening there? When Jacob came upon that well, they had to take off the stone so that the water would come out. It's basically a spring, right? And they had to put the stone back so it would not flood the valley. Think about that. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? Like if we really had the Lord taking care of our worship, whenever we worship, and we let the Lord do it for us? Because otherwise we would be... Can you imagine the difference between, between doing it while you're thirsty and just drinking from that water that's coming out of the ground? And it was so much... The pressure was so much so that they had to put the stone back in place. A big stone. To stop the, the flow of the water. What does that tell you? It was really... The strength was coming from the Lord for, for, for His provision. Of, of what it is like to be able to, to have living water. That's living water. But guess what? In the time of the Samaritans, after sin had taken over them because, because of the consequences of their sin and after, the, coming, after the, the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, how did, how, did they, how did the woman describe the well? Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. What had happened to the water? When we're striving, when we're doing it on our own strength, what happens? We don't, when we don't get strength and encouragement from God, we're doing it out of our own ability. Right? And we're saying, oh, what worship songs can I do today so that the people will be happy? Right? Is that possible? Or which songs do I choose so I can show off my ability to sing? Well, maybe not. I'm being too harsh. But isn't it also possible that Sometimes we come to church, even as a regular me member, and said, oh, I'm going to do this, get it over with, so that, you know. And sometimes we're actually pressured, pressured to just be there and show who we are, or so uh, make a show of who we are, and not really meet with the Lord. 
you might say, well, isn't that a little too presumptuous? But, but it is, is it also possible that it's not? That when we come to church and say, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this for reasons other than to meet with the Lord. And so when, when that happens, then he starts, he decides to not meet with us at that time. Because we didn't make an appointment with him, with him anyway, right? If I'm here just to give a message, or if you're here just to sit through, or rather, um, what do you call this? Uh, if, if you're here to endure it. Mm. And then the Lord will decide to not meet with us. At every, at every service, whenever the Lord doesn't show up, what, would have, what will have happened? Even if everybody was, like, got so thrilled with, with what they heard, and God did not show up, you probably would go home entertained, but nothing is going to change. You're going to be the same person you were. Verse 12. Are you greater than, than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks? And she was suggesting that because when Jacob was doing it, remember, the, the water was coming out and flowing, it was more than enough for everybody. And she was saying that it was actually there to satisfy everybody. But then uh, in Genesis 29, verse 10, it reads, And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of La Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and drove the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock, watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Basically, it was so, it, the, the pressure was so strong that everybody's uh, sheep got, got, uh, was, were given drink. Okay? But even so, verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Jesus was saying, no, even, you, even if you satiate your physical thirst, there's always going to be a, a, a different kind of thirst. A, uh, you will always suffer from this thirst. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a, a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Instead of just drinking regular water, we're supposed to have a source of water within us a source of satisfaction from within us that really is, is uh, would be there to, to let us know that we don't really need much else if we have the Spirit of the Lord. Okay? Now, if you're thirsty, and we will be thirsty again, it's the same uh, word used in verse 14, but whoever drinks this water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Not only is it going to satisfy satisfy our earthly desires and, and concerns, but also actually lead us into life eternal, to a, li to a living life in eternity. Verse 15, then the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Well, apparently she, was, she had started to believe and she was saying, well, actually, if this is true, then I don't have to come back here and get water again. Because you can visualize it, it must, it must not be easy, right? Some of you actually complain if there's no pressure in your faucet. But if you have to go walk miles just to be able to get water? In the Philippines, you would see when, when there's a well in the town and everybody's... Um, it's actually a social hub when you have to go get water in the, in the town, town well. And everybody has to walk a long, a long ways before they can actually get water. Here's another thing. What is it like to worship in, in truth? In verse 16, he, he, he turns and goes, he, he told her, go call your husband and come back. So, go call your husband and come back. So, Jesus knew what was really going on. Right? Because first, he allowed the, the, the disciples to go, to go and get some food. But here it says, uh, he knew what was really going on. Because the answer was in verse 17, I have no husband, he re she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you, when you say you have no husband. But I guess Jesus really knew what was going on. And it comes with omniscience. If the Lord knows everything, what does that mean? Is there anything we can hide from him? So even if we are able to fool everybody, hi, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know. Okay, let's worship. Let's worship, yeah. And then you're raising your hand like that. But then the Lord knows what's really going on in your heart. Is there anything we can hide from Him? 
What good is it to fool people whose opinions don't really matter? Or do they even think about us? They're probably concerned about themselves anyway. What do you think was Jesus' real purpose? In verse 17, she goes, I have no husband. Oh, so apparently Jesus had like touched a nerve in her life, right? I have no husband. Well, it, two possibilities. He said, I have no husband. She could have said that, right? Or she could have said, I have no husband. But either way, the answer comes back. The fact is that you have had five husbands and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the Lord knew. So in those times, rabbis actually, because there were, there, there were divorces then also, but then is the rabbis did not approve of more than three marriages. See, God said no divorce, right? But the rabbis were saying, oh, it's okay to have three. But then this woman was already in, at, had five, had five husbands. So she was in fact living an immoral life. And yet Jesus was pointing out what, what she was doing. You had five husbands. What does that tell you? What is this need in your life that you need to fill? What is this, uh, 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 what is this thing that you need to, to cover up that you have to have five husbands? Is it just because they kept dying off? What could have caused their deaths? Or did they leave her? What would have caused her to leave, caused them to leave? She must have been doing something, doing something wrong. This was indicative of an even deeper problem, that she was in fact thirsty, thirsty for something, as just Jesus pointed out her lifestyle. But when he says this, in verse 19, she goes, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Suddenly she makes it a religious conversation. Oh, you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but your Jews claim that, uh, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now she, makes, she goes back to apparently the, the discussion between the Gentile and the Jew. Oh, is it really on the mountain or it has to be in Jerusalem where we worship so that we will be acceptable to God? But then to that, Jesus' answer was, Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming and now is come when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, which, which was saying it's gonna, there's time coming when what you're doing is, is wrong, nor in Jerusalem, or there is a time coming when the Jews don't have to go to Jerusalem. You remember what happened to the curtain? What happened to the curtain in the temple? It got split, right? We have access now to God, whether we're in Jerusalem or on the mountain or wherever we are. We're able to, to enter the Holy of Holies. Praise the Lord. But differentiating the Jews and the Gentile worship, Jesus was saying, well, all of this would not really matter anymore. You will have access to God. And worship is not bound by, by our religion, but of faith and personal relationship with God. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation and of the Jews. It's like, it's like we're, we're worshiping Yahweh and you're not. But that's, beside, but that's actually beside the point because you don't really know what you're doing. Verse 23, yet a time is coming and is now come. Since later he will say, I, I am, or I am here. Yet I am is coming, yet at the time is coming when now, and is now come, when the true worshipers, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Did you catch that? It says, for they are the kind of worshipers that the, war, that the Father seeks. What does that tell us? That if we don't worship in spirit and in truth, is the Father looking for us? For that kind of worship? So when we come to church and just go sing songs, and okay, we're done, we go home, and not really meet with Him, are we the kind of people that the, that the Father is happy to, receive, uh, happy to receive our worship? Is that the kind of worship that God really seeks? Worship of any worth need to be acceptable for God. And worship in spirit and in truth is the only kind that pleases Him. Now what does this really mean? Um, it has to be done in the spirit, meaning it is from or inspired and executed by God. 
if we're doing, using our own strength to worship Him, we're, we're, we are assuming that who we are and what we can do is acceptable to God. Think about that. If we don't ask God's help to be able to worship Him in spirit, then what we're giving up to Him is human, flesh, right? Is God ever pleased to that? No, it has to be with the Spirit. It has to be by the Spirit moving us into worship. The believer then is enabled and encouraged to worship by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it is unacceptable worship. It has to be in faith. It had, as we live out the mercy and grace which God has called us to. When we worship and we're not thinking about the kind of mercy that we received, Right? We assume oh, without any second thoughts, we just walk into the sanctuary and say, Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We didn't even spend any time confess, uh, you know, confessing. We just assume God is okay with who we are and what we've done. Right? You just walk in and say, Oh, I'm going to lift up worship that is acceptable to you. Isn't it, isn't it a miracle that no, no lightning bolts have come through the roof? Okay, we need to live out the mercy and grace. So, what does it mean to live out the grace of God? To be for you to be able to say, "Well, I am covered by the blood, and therefore my worship is acceptable to God." We need to worship with gratitude as we acknowledge the worth of God in our lives by our worship and service. If that is not happening, our worship is not acceptable. Maybe we just need to rethink what it means to be able to do something that is acceptable to God. It has to be done in, done in truth. Uh, we must then learn to open ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. To let go of our situations and emotions and our very life to His molding. It's like we come to, our we come to the church and then we just assume and we're not, using, we're not calling the Spirit for help to worship, right? And then... And this is the situation in our life is just like, um, don't be touching it, Lord, because I don't want you in it. Well, maybe we don't put it into words like that, but we don't ever hash out the situations with, with God. We just come and go without really meeting with Him. Right? Um, to worship in spirit and in truth, uh, is doing it in the heart, where we are and as you are. Unless we are able to sit down with God and say, Lord, this is where I am. This is what I'm doing. This is who you are in my life or who you are not in my life. I'm sharing this with you because I've been there many times. Especially when you're busy for the Lord. Busy for the Lord and yet not, not really meeting with Him. Is that possible? I know it's possible. I've done it. Unless we are real with him. Oh, young people have a, have a say now. Get real, right? Or is it just me? I'm just the old one here. Anyway, you say get real. So, but can we actually get real with the Lord? Right? Getting real with the Lord is saying, Lord, um, do you have anything to say to me about my life? Or is it enough for me to sing Kumbaya, Lord, and, and, and endure the sermon and go home? Right? Um, unless you are real with Him, unless He is convicting you of sin, or encouraging you in the midst of your fears, or touching you where you hurt, He is not real to you. I'd like to read that again. Unless you are real with Him, unless he is convicting you when you sin or encouraging you in the midst of your fears or touching you where you hurt he is not real to you let not hypocrisy get between god and us because he has loved us and died for us for this very reason if we don't do this we're going to go through the motions of worship we're going to go through the motions of worship and that is not acceptable at all Verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Because God is spirit, there is nothing that can be hid from him. 
Understanding that God is spirit denies us the opportunity of presumptuousness and pretense. If he is spirit, can you see him when, when you were behind the door? What you were doing behind the door? Or in your house? When you were saying, oh, here it is again, Sunday, I have to go to church again. Right? He can see everything. There is a realm hidden from us. It is the realm of the spiritual. In it, nothing is created nor hidden from God. From it, his omnipotence and omniscience are made manifest. From it, he touches and watches all the physical realm. Knowing this makes us realize that acceptable, acceptable worship cannot be manufactured by the worshiper nor the worship team. It cannot be produced through programming or even great worship music. It has to come by the grace of God. Therefore, we must learn to open ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit when He touches hearts and minds and souls and our wills. Truthfulness before the Lord is necessary that, we might, that He may touch us where we live, in the innermost recesses of our hearts, without hypocrisy, without pretense, and in truth. The negative statements suggest to us that all worship was not, not done in spirit and in truth, is, an, is unacceptable and is an abomination to God. It is an insult to his power and authority, to his omnipotence and omniscience. So what does it really mean? When we're not worshiping in spirit and in truth, we're worshiping through works and hypocrisy. We're worshiping through re religiosity. What's religiosity? It's striving, right? God, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. Now you're indebted to me. Or legalism, when we see other people do wrong things. There is, no, there is no more effective way of assuring a parched and pretentious worship. You might say, oh, this is also negative. But I'm just sharing this, that there's a possibility that there, must, there can be something more that we can get out of our services here. The truth is, well, I, I believe that the Lord is here. And I can see Him, I have seen Him move in our midst. But this, it is also possible that for some of our brethren here, that they like, you know, they're just in and out. Or they're just like, nothing happened, right? There is, there is a gift that is waiting for them. There is, a, there is a possibility that they, as they know the Lord, they can actually get something more from, from the Lord. And, and really, when we come here, we're all, all going to come away different as we have been touched by God. As we have been touched by God. What does it really mean to worship in spirit and truth? Now, if we have been worshiping on our own strength and our knowledge, then it's all unacceptable to God. We need to acknowledge our limitations and let Him carry us into His presence to worship Him in spirit. Or is there a part of our lives that the Lord wants to touch, but we say, don't touch it, don't touch it. Oops, I'm sorry. We need to let Him take hold of it. Um, let Him, let his, let his touch be on whatever that is. I don't know if any, there's any, any among us who is hurting at this point, but maybe now is the time that you would let the Lord have his touch on that particular ache. Or there is a hidden sin. It might have been the perfect crime. I've committed a few perfect crimes. The only problem was I got saved, so now I have to tell them. But unless and until the Lord touches who I am, where I am, where I hurt, I'm going to come away untouched. Psalm 95 verses 1 to 7 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Let's pray.
Father, we acknowledge that none of this is possible unless you be pleased to dwell in our midst. We ask, Lord, that even as your word has been spoken, that you would be the one to touch us with it, Lord, to cause change in our lives, to cause us to all the more understand who you are and what you want to accomplish in our lives. We even ask, Lord, that tonight you would cause us, Lord, to take some time to consider our ways before you, to acknowledge, Lord, um, that we need you even as we worship. We need your truth in our lives. We need to, to keep it real when it comes to, be, to, to the things that are between you and us. We even pray, Lord, that as we all the more grow into knowing you, that we will also grow all the more and more transparent towards each other. Remind us, Lord, that only your opinion matters. And when we ever, whenever we seek, Lord, to fellowship and whenever we seek to, to meet, Lord, with you, that we might have a camaraderie that is not fleshly, merely fleshly or human, but rather of the Spirit. And we can be real with each other, Lord, because we are real before you. We thank you and commit to you, Lord, um, this, these truths in Jesus' name. Amen.